Thank you very much. Good morning. That's all you got? Good morning. This is the most important global transportation conference in the world all year long. We have a record number of attendants, 2,200 attendees from 24 countries. So let's have a little energy here. Good morning. Good morning. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, good enough. Not great, but good enough. Um, let's become a little self-aware and identify who we have in the room. How many people are BCOs? How many people are shippers? Please raise your hand. Okay, so about, I counted about four or 500 people raised their hand. That means about 100 some odd didn't raise their hands who are really shippers, because I know for a fact that there's over 600 shippers here. I know that from JOC telling me that. I know that from Greg Ritter, our chief customer officer, who's set up meetings with pretty much all of them over the next three days. How many people are ocean carriers? Please raise your hands. Okay, fantastic. How many people are 3PLs, NVOCCs, freight forwarders? Quite a bit, okay. How many people are terminal operators associated with a port? Okay, intermodal? Some intermodal. Trucking, drayage? How many people are technology providers? Quite a bit, that tells us something too. What other categories did I miss? This pretty much covers most of, the, most of the people here. Let's go about geographically. How many people came from Asia? Okay, looks like about 20%. How many people came from Europe? Similar amount. How many North America? A larger amount. How about rest of world? Latin America, okay, great. So it's, it is a global conference, and that's the theme of what I want to speak about. So when I was invited to give this keynote presentation by JOC, I was first of all humbled because the speakers who have spoken for the keynote presentation in the last 16 years are the luminaries of the industry. Last year, Frank Oppel, of, uh, the head of Deutsche Post DHL, spoke. I can't compare to his, his intellect. This is a guy who's got a PhD in um, neurobiology, got master's degrees in chemistry. He more or less invented the warehouse of the future, which is now the warehouse of the present. And the slogan is a slogan that I wish we had thought about. Focus, connect, grow. And I want to talk a lot about the connect part of that focus, connect, grow. A couple years before, Soren Sko spoke. This is someone who, when he became CEO of Maersk, had a billion dollar profit swing, took over a company that was losing a half a billion dollars, and a year later was making a half a billion dollars. So my hat's off to Soren Sko. And I read the, I saw the YouTubes that are online about from previous speakers, and I also uh, read the media articles that came out from, from the previous speakers. And I got to give the award for most profound quote to C.C. Tung, the powerful head of Orient Overseas, who said, I believe that information is the oxygen of the modern age. Information is the oxygen of the modern age. And then in 2014, Fred Smith. Fred Smith gave the keynote presentation. Fred Smith, in my opinion, is the most important innovator in the history of transportation since Henry Ford. So for 16 years, there's been a tradition of the keynote speaker coming up and offering conversation starters, thought ideas, of things that could be discussed over the next couple of days. So I, I've come up with seven thought ideas that I think might be uh, useful for starting the conversation. The first one is my opinion that we, as global transportation professionals, have a duty have a responsibility, have an obligation, have an ethical, we need to have an ethical commitment to transcend nationalism and to really think and act globally. How many people are my age and remember 35, 40 years ago there was a television series on PBS called Cosmos with Carl Sagan? Okay, a handful of people. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it was a 
It was a documentary series on nature and on science and on the cosmos, on the universe. And one of the last episodes showed a spacecraft going up into space and looking down at Earth, the blue planet. And Carl Sagan, this scientist, was saying, and look at Earth, the blue planet. There's no boundaries. You don't see the national boundaries. These are all man-made. They're not organic. And that's true. The national boundaries are boundaries that we've made, humans have made. They're not made by nature. That leads me to my next thought that I'd like to offer, which is, in my opinion, global trade will reduce the number one problem in the world right now, which is terrorism. I read a book oof, about 10, 15 years ago by Dr. Aaron Beck, and it was called Prisoners of Hate. And it was analyzing the psychology of a terrorist. And basically what it said was, to be a terrorist, you have to think, I think it was about four different, you had to have about four different beliefs in total. First belief was, I strongly believe in X, Y, Z to be absolutely, positively, 100% true. Second belief, which by itself is a very harmless belief. The second belief was, I believe that other people, in fact all other people, should also share those beliefs, beliefs categorized in category number one. The third belief was, this is the mind of the terrorist, that, and if everyone else does not share in my commitment to the truthfulness of these beliefs, then that's an awful, horrible, ter terrible, unsustainable situation leading to belief number four, and therefore I must kill them. And that's how terrorists think. They think very small. They haven't been exposed to the whole world. Terrorists have been exposed to one small sliver of the, their world. And global trading will help, in my opinion, to dispel that narrowness of thinking. I believe that, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how it evolves, privacy will be sacrificed for security over the next 10 or 15 years. I think there's a hypothesis that could be true that in order for global security, eventually, as technology evolves, our whole lives will be recorded from the moment that we're born. Everything we see, just like a policeman has a camcorder to record what happened, we may have a chip or there may be some technology that not only records what we see and what we say and what others say to us, but also even what we think. Imagine the ramifications if that comes true. Thought number three, coming into our industry, as the earlier speakers said, there's been an enormous amount of consolidation that took place last year. My view is that more, even more, global consolidation in the transportation industry is going to take place. It's inevitable, particularly in ocean transportation. Why am I picking on ocean transportation as the one segment? Because if you look at the opportunities to improve on-time performance, invoice accuracy, and visibility of the freight, it's an enormous opportunity. It's nowhere near Six Sigma. Why is on-time performance, invoicing accuracy, and visibility of the freight not at peak levels, not at high levels in this, in this, in this, in this part of the supply chain? It's as if the metabolism of the industry is off because there's an underinvestment in technology. When I say metabolism, it's like so in our body, we have a, we have a thyroid and we have an um, immune system that is constantly measuring how we're relating to the environment and making adjustments as a result of that to keep us within a safe band, not too hot, not too cold. And in the ocean container industry, the metabolism is off. It's like the thyroid's not working. There's overcapacity, there's undercapacity, away, big, big swings. Over time, with global consolidation, I believe more efficiency will be brought to the industry and those swings won't be as great. Which brings me to thought number four, which is mergers are tricky and sometimes very difficult, but worth it. I say they're tricky and difficult because having done 500 of them, you have to do a lot of things right to get a merger to work. You've got to get the cultures meshed into one new culture. You can't have two legacy cultures. You have to get everyone on one technology platform. You've got to get the whole back office integrated, HR, 
finance accounting, sales and marketing. You have to face the customers as one company, and you have to do all this very quickly and seamlessly and accurately, or you're going to lose your customer service, and therefore you're going to lose your customers. Having put that disclaimer out there that mergers are not for the faint of heart, they're not for people who have management teams, they're not for management teams that aren't experienced in the, the complexities of doing acquisitions. That said, I do believe that there's big upside to the industry by getting economies of scale, by getting enough revenue so that investments can be made in technology in order to improve what needs to be improved in the business. Thought number five, integration of transportation modes, air, sea, intermodal, truck, last mile, everything, A to Z, is going to increase. When I speak to chief logistics officers or heads of global supply chains at our, at our customers, I hear the same story over and over again. And that story is, Help me, I've got my CFO or COO or CEO, depending on who they report to, on my back telling me I'm spending $500 million or $5 billion in transportation, find me 2%. And the chief logistics officer tells the C-suite, well, I can do that. I just go to all my vendors, I can squeeze them all and say, hey, the big cheese wants us to knock 2% off. You want to keep the relationship? Knock 2% off. Service may go down. And when capacity changes and the balance changes, we may not get capacity, but we can do that. Or instead of doing that, instead of squeezing the vendors, they can work with the vendors, with the carriers, with the 3PLs, in order to function more efficiently, in order to function more effectively, to find in the supply chain where there is waste, where there is inefficiency, where there are defects in the process, and to collaboratively remove those defects, to get not just the 2% improvement that the C-suite is asking for, but sometimes very substantially more. And if we do not do that, shippers will do it themselves. They will find a way to do it, because the intensity of focus on the C-suite throughout the global corporations around the world is very intense to take out more cost, to show more productivity. And transportation and logistics is a big spend, and it's an obvious target to go after. Thought number six, information technology is even more important than we already know it is. Somebody asked me the other day, if you had to take all your money and put it into one stock and hold it for 20 years, what would that stock be? So I left out our own company, don't want to do a paid commercial for our, an unpaid commercial for ourselves. So I said that would clearly would be Google. Why Google? Because Google's mission, Google's business plan, is to organize all the information in the world and make it readily accessible to everyone. How cool is that? To organize all the information in the world and make it easily accessible to every single person. That's where I think our industry is going. That's where I think all industries are going. Our industries are about information. In our case, it's about information of where freight is, where it needs to go, and what's the best and most efficient way to get there. In addition to information technology, the other big trend in technology, I think, that's going to affect this group, who's mainly focused in international trade, is 3D printing. Why do I say 3D printing? 3D printing, first of all, is, is at least five or 10 years away from being prevalent. And you wouldn't ordinarily think of something, a machine that's in somebody's basement or in a FedEx Kinko's as affecting international trade lanes. But it will, because so many things that are now made in low cost labor countries and then shipped long distances and imported we will not necessarily have to do that anymore. It won't be necessary to do that anymore because those goods will be made, the information of how to make them will be encoded and decoded in a 3D printer right on site. And you look around the room and you see the things, everything in this room, almost everything that's carbon-based, and that's not everything other than human beings in this room eventually will be able to be manufactured, eventually, by 3D printing. 
shorter supply chains. Brings me to point number seven. Idea number seven is that communication and connectedness are becoming even more intense. Communication and connectedness are becoming even more intense. This has profound ramifications for intermediaries. Intermediaries could be disintermediated by this over time. Look at what Alibaba and Maersk signed just a couple of months ago. It didn't get too much press, but I think it's a really, really important event where you have uh, a major shipper, or indirectly their customer shippers. Alibaba is more of a marketplace, more like an eBay than, than an Amazon is, which is a retailer. But indirectly, the shippers on Alibaba connecting directly to the transport company, directly with no intermediaries. Let's watch that space. I believe what's going on in the big picture, the big mega trend is artificial intelligence is getting exponentially better and the progress in artificial intelligence is accelerating and machine to machine communication without the involvement of human beings is where the future is going and that's going to have profound implications for global transportation. Knowing where things are to start with and where they have to go and the most efficient way to get from here to there, we don't have that nailed yet here in 2017. We don't know where all the freight is right this minute by a long shot. We don't have it all mapped out where it needs to go in order to finally get to the last mile to the consumer. We will have that someday and there will be machine to machine communication that does almost all the jobs of all of us here in this room. So those are the seven thoughts I had to get a conversation going before we open up for Q&A. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity to meet with you and open up for questions. Um, you mentioned uh, expecting a, a faster clip in consolidation, particularly on the, on the ocean side. Um, when it comes to XBO, where are you seeing, are you looking for new um, companies to acquire or are you, or, or are you still in that second phase of uh, bringing in the non-assets and assets integration? We're not going to be buying any companies in the near term. From 2011 to 2015, we looked at about 2,000 companies to buy. We selected 17 of what we considered the best ones, ones that had leading positions, ones that were complementary to the other 16. And uh, we're happy with what we've got now. And there's a big opportunity to further optimize the platform that we've got. Now, eventually, whether that's in a year or two years or three years or whenever, sure, we'll return to the acquisition market. But it will probably be more in contract logistics. We have 750 warehouses now. I'd like to build up that footprint. Uh -huh, thanks. Uh, hey, Brad. Hi. Mongo Luzo, hey, Journal Brad. of Commerce. Uh, your point uh, about sharing communication, uh, information, machine to machine, all you know, spot on. Uh, I want to focus just on the marine terminal. Uh, you have the ocean carrier, the terminal operator, forwarder, broker, trucker, BCO, etc. Um, each sector has a lot of information that it needs to operate itself. What is preventing all of these sectors to share their information together? Is it technology is not there yet, or is it just a, a refusal by the partners to get together? I think it's time. I think ultimately Adam Smith's hidden hand of capitalism will force all those participants you mentioned to cooperate with each other, to share information, because the net result will be more efficiency. And that's what we as a transportation industry have to deliver. That's our mission. Our mission is to move goods through the supply chains of our customers more efficiently, more cost effectively, more accurately, more predictably. And sharing information in a proper way, in a legal way, is, what is, a, is, is, is a big element in succeeding to do that. And is the technology there? I mean, do we have the type of single portal where uh, each sector can provide information and disseminate it? It is and it isn't. It could be developed and integrated very easily, but there's so many different platforms that so many of those players are using that there is no one single platform. But that's not a huge order if everyone had the resolve to go ahead and do that. Uh, as a futurist and somebody who specializes in looking over the edge of the horizon and is pretty good at it, 
could you offer an opinion on autonomous vehicles, both when you think they'll become a factor and what the, the effects of that will be on our, on our business? Yes. So we just finished an RFP about a month ago with, uh, with trucks, with truck suppliers. So we're in the middle of doing RFPs, global purchasing bids, with all our vendors, for $13 billion worth of vendors. And one of the first ones we tackled was, was trucks, was tractors and trailers. And so as part of every single presentation, unprompted, from the truck manufacturers, from the OEMs, was what they're doing with autonomous vehicles and where that's going. And there were some little differences, but the general consensus was, in stages, autonomous trucks will be present on the highways in three years, and, be, and the next stage will be present on the highway in five to seven years, and in 10 years from now, there'll be fully autonomous trucks everywhere. This is the United States I'm speaking, United States and Europe. Europe's actually a little bit ahead of, our, ahead of the United States in autonomous vehicles. I'm not up to date on where we are with autonomous vehicle regulation in, in uh, Asia, because at the end of the day, it's not about the technology. The technology is almost there. I mean, there's a lot of big companies putting a lot of R&D into, and they have been for several years now, in autonomous uh, vehicles. What needs to be developed now is the regulatory environment so that it's more safe. Ultimately, I'm very convinced it will be much more safe. Um, you know, computers don't, don't drink and drive. Computers don't fall asleep and get sleep apnea. Con computers see things in program more. But computers also go on the blink, as we all know. So there has to be fallback systems for that. And there has to be very tight cybersecurity in those autonomous vehicles, or else criminals and foreign countries and bad guys in general will go into other countries and use that to re wreak havoc. So there is, there, is a, there is some regulatory, just like with drones, Drones, technology is already there actually right now. The regulatory environment to make it a safe rollout is many years away because it's a pretty complicated issue. But it, both of those are here and they're going to be here more and more. That's undeniable. As uh, direct carriers become more integrated with uh, technology, do you see a need for NVOCCs in the future? Do I see a what? A need for NVOCCs in the future? I do. I don't think that intermediaries will be completely 100% intermediated. Because I think there's, if you look at other industries, if you look at the oil business, you look at construction, you look at commodities, you look at Wall Street, there's a role for intermediaries. Because intermediaries tend to be more agile, more flexible, more adaptable to change, more forward thinking, more nimble, and that can create some value. So it's the, the, what, it'll morph, it'll transform what intermediaries will do, but their ingenuity, I believe, will win out. Excuse me. Is this mic on? I'm not sure. Yes, uh, this is John DeCesare with WCL Consulting. Bradley, when you talked about mergers are tricky, and one of the first elements you talked about was the cultural blend, mm -hmm. could you share with us some of the techniques that your investment due diligence team look at to see what the gap would be between the buyer and the buy-e culture? Well, it's the, probably the most, the single most important thing to get right when you do an acquisition. Make sure that before you do the acquisition, you know for a fact that your cultures are compatible. Because it's very difficult to change a culture. If you're an honest company and you're buying a dishonest company, you're not gonna change that culture to your level of ethics just by rolling out a code of business ethics. If you're a fast-moving company and you buy a company that's a slow-moving company, it's difficult to get them to move at a different pace. If you're a company that's performance oriented, if you have a high level, of, I have culture that has a high level of accountability and you're buying a company that is more on the, the pendulum of work-life balance, more on the, the life than the work, it's, and not prone to incentive compensation, that's gonna be difficult to merge those cultures. None of those are impossible, but they're very, very difficult. So what you have to do is really understand what the culture is. You have to demonstrate what value you're bringing to the relationship to each of those stakeholders and convince them that working together is a winner for both parties. And you have to show all those stakeholders that you actually do value the relationship. That's why you just spent millions or billions of dollars to buy the company. So it's an elaborate process and one that is fraught with mistakes. Well, Brad, thank you again. Um, and also thank you for the Container Port Group for sponsoring this session. Um, I want to, just as a small sign of our appreciation, I would like to 
give you a Thank you very much. speaker award. Thank you. And I'd also like to uh, welcome Brad Lawfer with the Lawfer Group International, who will be coming up to stage to introduce uh, our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.